Hi everyone, my name is Natalie. Today I wanted to finally get around to doing my August wrap-up. So I'm going to start off with the two books I read for Invisible Cities. We have Nowhere to be Found by Bay Sua, translated by Sir Kim Russell. Uh, this is my second book by Bay Sua. This is a South Korean uh, author. It follows a protagonist who works in an admin sort of job and during the day and she works in a restaurant at night, I think. So she spends most of her um, waking hours working and she has a boyfriend who is a soldier and he is in a camp training um, and when the book begins uh, we just follow her every day and her thinking about her life and how she wants to um, in what direction she wants to move uh, and what she wants to do with her life uh, so it is quite introspective and I really like the voice of the protagonist. She is going to meet her boyfriend and uh, from that point onwards the narrative becomes uh, kind of um, turned upside down and it's unclear exactly what is happening, uh, what is the true parts of what is happening and what is fantasy. That is something that she plays with in Unt Untold Night and Day as well. The borders between truth and fantasy or imagination um, and how in Untold Night and Day she really played with um, different versions of the same truth or the same event. The storytelling and the narrative ownership and uh, and, and the perspectives on truth, all things that I really enjoyed exploring in the other book. Um, and I feel like it was more, the themes were more polished in Until Night and Day. I did enjoy the first half of the book when it was fairly um, easy to follow it, but then it sort of lost me a bit. I still find Besu a really interesting writer, um, and I definitely want to read more of her backlist and also what she publishes in the future, but I know that this is one of her earlier works, so um, I would say if you are interested in reading her books, then I would uh, recommend Until Night and Day over this one. The other book that I read for Invisible Cities is The Fisherman by Shigozi Obioma. I listened to this on audio. Uh, I will put the uh, audio narrator's name here. Um, this book is about uh, a group of brothers, uh, especially four of the brothers, and there is a man in the village where they live that basically makes a prediction uh, related to one of the brothers and what someone will do in the brother group and the, this actual the prediction itself changes has a, a, a large impact on all of the brothers in the family this book is a lot about how a crisis in a family affects the different family members in different ways um, and sort of the the crisis point and all of the fractions that um, it results in and in such deep ways. I thought the family dynamics was really well explored both in terms of the dynamic in the sibling group as well as the relationship between the parents and the sibling group as a whole. Another thing I really liked about this is that it's very much centered around storytelling as a theme and I think that made the audiobook format really work. It was the kind of story that I uh, lost myself in and that I felt very immersed in. It is sort of comments on the power of suggestion uh, and the, the power of someone else's interpretation of you and of your life, of your future and prospects and how as an individual how you come to your own conclusions about yourself and your life and how you want to live your life and um, how you relate to others' interpretations of you. Uh, another smaller thing or a smaller theme of this book that I really liked was the, um, the comments around language. So uh, there is this mention of uh, the parents, how they usually use their native language to talk to their kids, but then when they are angry, when they are reprimanding them, they switch over to English. And uh, English in their community is um, the kind of language that you use with strangers. Uh, so the language use itself symbolizes the distance uh, between the speakers and so when their parents switch over to the English tongue um, that is already a meaning in itself uh, and I thought it was really interesting how 
how the how language was played with in the interactions and the dialogues, as well as um, a, a larger commentary on sort of the the Western and African um, cultures uh, sort of meeting, because the father uh, is constantly talking about how he wants uh, his sons to have a Western education, and it's there's so much meaning centered around that word and that concept. Um, so yes, yeah, so I read this book for Nigeria, for Invisible Cities. I really enjoyed it, especially the audiobook. Two books that I have already mentioned in the Memoirs I Love video that I read in August. First, we have Small Bodies of Water by Nina Minge Powells. Uh, this is a memoir slash essay collection with personal essays and many of the essays relate to water in a physical sense, um, to the experience of being in bodies of water, to having a connection to the sea, um, to islands, to swimming, as well as uh, sort of the, the the bodily bodies of water, like the, the human body itself containing a lot of water. and and those kinds of things as well. Uh, but there's a lot of other topics in this book, uh, like food uh, and how food relates to family, um, about uh, language, uh, language learning, uh, especially in connection with mother tongues, which is again a theme that I am really drawn to. Um, she talks about being mixed race and much of the themes that she talks about sort of interweaves with each other. Uh, they become braids of, of conversations that um, the fact that she is mixed race shapes some of her other discussions. The uh, discussions on mother tongue is also weaved into the discussion on, um, uh, on nature and her um, like for example, native words for uh, different flower species, things like that. I really loved how she combined so many different strands of thought and so many different thematic explorations into this um, into this whole that still felt cohesive. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this one and was strongly recommended. I also uh, watched a talk with Nina Minge Powell and Jessica J. Lee uh, at the beginning of September that was absolutely Absolutely fantastic. If it is available on YouTube, I will link it in the description. Um, but yeah, it just furthered my appreciation for both of them. The other book that I mentioned in the memoirs recommendations video is The Cost of Living by Deborah Levy. This is the second in uh, Deborah Levy's living uh, autobiography series or trilogy. A lot of it is about writing. Um, and the craft of writing and having a space to write so she sort of taps into um, a room of one's own and in a physical way but also in a, a mental way the space and the peace of mind in order to write. I sort of view um, Deborah Levy in this in a kind of group with other authors like Rachel Cusk and uh, Joan Didion. Uh, sort of writers that to me talk about a lot of the same topics like grief, femininity and motherhood. Um, having a space to write and create um, and, and talking about place and that kind of things. Those kinds of things and family. Um, whereas in comparison to Rachel Cusk and Joan Didion, for me, Deborah Levy is a very human or warm author, uh, compared to, contrary to what I was expecting out of her writing. This is the, the type of book that I can see myself returning to in moments when I need, uh, when I need that sense of comfort. Um, and a lot of it, I think, is because she talks about human connections and making meaningful connections with others through her writing, through her friendships, through her family and her relationship with her daughters, through her connection with herself as well and how she is willing to look into that relationship and to, um, to, ch to change it and to adapt to her life changing. This was one of uh, the sections that I really liked. The night is softer than the day, quieter, sadder, calmer. The sound of wind tapping windows, the hissing of pipes, the entropy that makes floorboards 
floorboards creak, the ghostly night bus that comes and goes, and always in cities, a far off distant sound that resembles the sea, yet is just life, more life. Then I read a book for Women in Translation Month, so obviously the Beisua book was also a Women in Translation Month book. Uh, this is a Family Lexicon by Natalia Ginsberg, and this is translated by Jenny McPhee. I buddy read this with Roxy from Chaotic Bibliophile. I will link her in the description below. So basically this is a family portrait. Uh, the Family Lexicon title I think is a pretty good summary of, of the concept of the book, in the sense that you are introduced to a family in the 20th century in Italy. You learn about their inside jokes, about their sayings, about the way they talk about specific events that they share that has a particular meaning in that family that all of these things they would have no significance to, to an outsider. But you are getting all of this very intimate information that you would only get if you were part of this family. Uh, the protagonist becomes the representative of, of the family to tell the family's story and especially the sibling's story. The way this book is written is basically a collection of fragments. Fragments of uh, various events, various memories, various conversations, and they all build up to create this family lexicon, this family portrait. But the problem for me was that the fragments on an individual level don't really hold up, so it doesn't matter as much when you get lost in the flow of the book, but as soon as you stop to uh, scrutinize a single fragment, it just sort of melts into nothing uh, for me. I, I think that the concept and the, the structure of the entire book was better for me than the actual writing uh, and the craftsmanship of the book. This wasn't as much of a problem in the first 60% uh, of the book or so uh, because we are very much within this core family. All of their individual voices uh, become a collective and therefore the fact that they don't stand on their own doesn't matter. But when uh, after about the 60% point they start to to unravel, the, uh, the family become um, more separate as the children of the family grow up and create their own families and move away to new places. When they were standing on their own in the latter parts of the book uh, it just didn't hold up. I liked the concept more than I actually liked the execution. I liked the ideas and the themes more than I, I liked the actual writing. I will probably try uh, one of Natalia Ginsberg's shorter books because I feel like it, her fragmentary style of writing probably lends itself better to a novella type form. Then I finally finished The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle. I've been buddy reading this collection with Roxy and Amelia. Again, I will link them below. Um, we started reading the Sherlock Holmes novels last year and we finally finished off The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes in... I want to say in early August. There is interesting characters coming up in these stories such as Moriarty making some appearances. Uh, there is a lot of fun uh, Sherlock and Watson interactions especially. Um, it, it, you can sort of see the way their relationship uh, develops over time and how comfortable Sherlock is with Watson, how how Watson misses Sherlock's company when there's a bit of a gap in their meetings uh, and he sort of drops by often to Baker Street just to hang out. Um, I like the a lot of the uh, mysteries in this collection is not actually crimes. A lot of the cases are set setups of it seems too good to be true and it was. Okay, lastly we have two brief short books that I read this uh, in August. First we have Barbara by Nicole Miles. I read it in one gulp and loved it. Uh, so obviously I have a bit of a bias because I love Nicole. I have always loved her illustration style. Um, it kind of reminds me of uh, a lot of the children's book illustrators that I really love and the 
comic illustrators as well from uh, types uh, publishers like Boom Studios and um, Flying Eye Books. The story itself is also about a woman who meets this plant that changes her life and she becomes a vegan. The story of, of the woman becoming a vegan is something that is close to my heart uh, as I have been vegan I think for three years now I think. Um, and she faces some uh, negativity of the people around her, which is definitely relatable to me. Um, and it's just beautiful and a story that, as I said, I could relate to. And lastly uh, is another fantastic a tiny book that is on contemporary art by Caesar Era, translated by Catherine Silver. It would be a perfect book for Shorty September. Part of a series by David Sorner Books called Ekphrases. Phrases. Uh, it's a collection of books with various writers writing on art. It's basically uh, an essay on contemporary art and what it is and a kind of um, defense for contemporary art and he talks about a lot of things like for example the difficulty in capturing um, contemporary art in, in photographs and in he reads uh, art um, art magazines and he talks about the fact that uh, these magazines in, in the writing on contemporary art constellations and and, um, and collections is very difficult for them to convey because a lot of contemporary art is about the fiscal space and the the audience uh, being part of the contemporary art. A lot of this uh, essay talks about the viewer of the art and the art piece and the interaction between that and interpretation, which is something I really liked um, to think about. A lot of it uh, talks, of course, about the fact that contemporary art is so specifically in a time, uh, in time, and how it negates the time passing and history, but also the way it is uh, can very easily become passé because of course it's contemporary. Um, so I think there was a lot of interesting things to me about the tempus of contemporary art uh, and and what it what it means this this terminology um, to set it a, to set it apart from uh, earlier. Um, art periods. As I said, he talks about the, the, the timing aspect. Ludicrously, ludicrously renounces history and spreads itself out as a permanent present. Art, on the other hand, isn't art if it's done well. That is, if it sub submits to already established values. That was another thing I thought, thought was really interesting. The purpose of art and the purpose of art to actually be... Uh, to not be polished enough to be called craft. So he sort of touches on the difference between art and craft and the purpose of art to further and to, to make something new and to change the status quo. It's not necessary to do art well and making an effort to do so is a lamentable waste of time which young people often fall into. If it is art or for it to be art, it should create new values. It doesn't need to be good. On the contrary, if it can be called good, that means it's obeying already fixed par parameters of quality and so can be placed, according to this novel 18th century concept, reinterpreted by me in the category of craft. Uh, so I just think he's such an interesting... Uh, he has so many interesting points to make uh, in this tiny, tiny book um, and it's basically just one essay and a forward and then an afterward as well. Um, but I just, there was a lot of things that th that uh, he discusses that I was thinking about in, in relation to literature and to books that um, are playing with form, are going against uh, genres, are um, mixed media, are, uh, are very experimental, over, um, 
sort of classical storytelling. There's so many things um, in, in literature that I was thinking about in, in connection with what he's talking about for art. So those are the books that I finished in August. I would love to know if you read anything for Women in Translation Month or Invisible Cities this month or you read anything else good in August. I would love to hear about it and chat about it in the comments below. I hope you're doing well and you're taking care of yourselves and I will talk to you soon.